Welcome to TopCast, and for a special episode, and probably what will become a special series, on Steven Pinker's new book, Rationality. Now, I didn't really plan on making a series about this. It's only because, well, it's been getting a lot of attention recently. Steven Pinker's been doing lots of interviews, and I know that Steven Pinker happens to be a great admirer of The Beginning of Infinity, as well as David Deutsch himself. And so I thought it'd be interesting to go through his book on rationality because the chapters really do cross over with so much of what I've discussed here on TopCast. Not only is the book called Rationality, and Steven Pinker's going to have a particular take on what that concept is all about, but, well, let's run through what the chapter titles are, and you can see why I'd be drawn to it. Chapter 1 is called How Rational an Animal. Chapter 2, Rationality and Irrationality. Chapter 3, Logic and Critical Thinking. Chapter 4, Probability and Randomness. Chapter 5, Beliefs and Evidence, in brackets, Bayesian reasoning. Chapter 6, risk and reward, rational choice. Chapter 7, hits and false alarms. Chapter 8, the self and others, which is about game theory. Chapter 9, correlation and causation. Chapter 10, what's wrong with people? Chapter 11, why rationality matters. Now, Steven Pinker will be familiar to many of you. For those who are unfamiliar, he's a Harvard cognitive scientist. His original training is in... uh his original training, um, Wikipedia tells me, is in psychology. He's got bachelor's and a PhD in that area. But he's the author of many popular science books. My favourite of those, one, many of them are in the vein of The Beginning of Infinity. And my favourite one of his recent ones is called The Better Angels of Our Nature, which is basically about how progress has indeed been occurring over the last few millennia centuries especially, and it appears to be increasing in the rapidity with which it improves society. And so I have uh, no disagreement with him on any of those things. And so a book like Better Angels of Our Nature, which explains all of the trends that have been going on, technological, scientific, moral, that have been happening, somewhat relentlessly, if not inevitably, we don't say that it's inevitable, but it has been occurring, and that demands an explanation. An explanation which I would argue is quite well articulated in the work of David Deutsch in the beginning of Infinity, but it's good to have other optimists out there pointing out that indeed things are getting better. It seems to be a minority opinion these days, despite the clarity with which we can see and analyse these trends of improvement. So Stephen Pinker is definitely on our side, so to speak. He stands against the pessimists, at least to some extent, and so it's good to have a prominent ally like him. And certainly, as I say, he's been inspired by David Deutsch. He's praised publicly David Deutsch and his work on a number of occasions. Uh, in particular, uh, one of his other more recent works called Enlightenment Now. He quotes David Deutsch and the beginning of Infinity quite heavily. Okay, top five science or psychology books. The book that I really enjoyed, partly because it resonated with Enlightenment Now, but from a different angle, is David Deutsch's book, The Beginning of Infinity. Deutsch is a theoretical physicist, and this was a book also on progress, also on the Enlightenment, but unlike what I did, which was to plot graphs on you know, lifespans going up, death from disease going down, and so on, he reasons really from first principles. How can we understand the universe? How is explanation possible? What drives science? How does the human mind stretch itself to do science? And it was, it's a, a, a profound, weighty book, but, uh, but not filled with jargon or, or uh, uh, too much technical detail. Also, but also in Enlightenment Now, he does quote the Humanist Manifesto, part three, from 2003. And he quotes the part, and I'll just read it, where it says, Knowledge of the world is derived by observation, experimentation, and rational analysis, end quote. That's from the 
Humanist Manifesto. Now, of course, uh, if you're familiar with the work of David Deutsch, your ears will prick up on that word derived. And I'm highlighting it now because having read through uh, the book, Rationality, um, uh, very quickly I read through it. I, I've got it in triplicate. I've got it there in paperback. I've got it on my Kindle, which is where I'll be reading from today. And I've got it on audiobook as well. That kind of helps me get through books like this much more quickly than I otherwise might. But when I hear words like that, and Pinker holds that up as as being a sort of maxim by which we can judge rationality or not, knowledge of the world being derived by observation, etc. It makes me think, well, to be generous, maybe he just thinks that the word derived means created. So knowledge of the world is created through observation in some way, in some method, without judging what that method might be. In an ungenerous mood, we might say, well, he's just falling back on empiricism. And I think as we move through rationality, we will see that there is a deeply empiricist vein in the philosophy that Steven Pinker is using in order to explain what rationality is. And so there will be some quibbles that I will have at various points about the extent to which Steven Pinker really understands how knowledge is not only created, but how we can come to understand or obtain objective knowledge. I don't know that he appreciates what people like, let's say, Karl Popper have explained how it is that knowledge is generated at all and what knowledge, more broadly speaking, might amount to. And we're going to see some, well, what I would plainly call errors in epistemology early on. All of that said, I still recommend the book. I think that if you are after a good summary, or if you've never been able to afford through expense or through distance or through opportunity to be able to go to one of these top American universities and take on a course like critical thinking or rationality taught by an excellent academic like Steven Pinker, then reading this book would be an excellent substitute. Now, I'm not going to do a complete series of this book as I've done for those other books that I discuss. I'm going to do about two chapters at a time, more or less. He does say that, and quote from the preface of the book, Pinker wrote, quote, This book grew out of a course I taught at Harvard, which explored the nature of rationality and the puzzle of why it seems to be so scarce, end quote. And as I read it, I thought, yes, indeed, it reads like a series of university lectures, extremely well written. And of course, it's going to be well written because Steven Pinker wrote a book on how to write well. And he specializes in linguistics and writing. So I can certainly recommend this book to people unfamiliar, for example, with that anything that Deutsch or Popper have ever written and who might be new to critical thinking and want to have an insight into what perhaps university academics think critical thinking is or think rationality is and what university students would be consuming in their lectures and tutorials if they take on a course about, let's say, philosophy or critical thinking at the undergraduate level. but if you, So if you can't afford to have ever gone to Harvard University, say, due to time or money or location, then this is an excellent substitute, I would argue. Now, the book is titled Rationality, but if I could give it a long academic subtitle, it would be something like Perceived Errors in Thinking using contemporary examples drawn from political matters, especially important in the United States in the early 2020s. Now, that might be terribly ungenerous. Of course, many of the errors that Pinker is going to discuss throughout this book, errors in thinking, for example, are indeed timeless, even if many of the examples won't be. I, I personally have a preference for more timeless works or works that can be basically picked up by anyone at any time without needing a huge amount of background knowledge about the current affairs going on in a particular time or location when and where the book was written. And this is why I think most of, for example, Popper's works stand the test of time. And of course, both of David's books are eminently like this. Hopefully what Naval and I have done on that podcast of his is like this. And what if you ever listen to Jocko Willink, he does these wonderful history wartime podcasts, which you could pick up in the year 3000. And I think they would still stand on their own as great reflections on the conflicts of the past. And, and the 
reason I have this preference is that I think that an author or a podcaster, for example, who wants to create a product that does stand the test of time needs the benefit of hindsight. And that won't be possible while you're still either within the events of the day or immediately after the events of the day. And in many cases, I'd say even 10 years after the big events of our time won't be long enough. And I'm, I'm just laboring this because Rationality, the book Rationality, has references to particular politicians and particular national or sometimes global events and events that uh, happen to still be in progress. And in a sense, I guess Professor Pinker is trying to navigate some of the most difficult issues and attempting to clarify ways of thinking best about these contemporary issues. Now, before I begin by reading some excerpts from the book and making some comments about those excerpts, I just might make a few more remarks before I begin. Uh, Stephen Pinker, Professor Pinker, like Matthew Riley, is often spoken about as being one of our prominent optimists. And I think that's quite right. Absolutely, these public intellectuals are optimists of a kind, but not always in the vein in which the beginning of infinity describes what optimism is. Remember what that is. That is that all evils are due to a lack of knowledge. It's this deep understanding that we can solve problems. Problems are soluble. That's the sense in which we talk about optimism as being linked to knowledge and the knowledge is linked to physics because as, if there's not a physical law, it's not a law of physics actually standing in your way of solving the problem, that problem is soluble. And evil, including things that cause suffering, are just a kind of problem, just a kind of thing that we need to turn our knowledge creating abilities towards. And so that's what we mean about optimism. In the case of Steven Pinker, he's written one of the most popular books on why we should indeed have hope and gratitude for the now, for the time in which we are living, because the past was, of course, so much worse. It's amazing that needs to be said, but it does need to be said because we are living in an era, I think unusually, where things have never been better, but they're talked about as if they're getting worse or that they've never been as bad as what they are now, and yet things are getting better. You know, and I, I include everything from the economic to the moral to the cultural, even the political and the environmental, and so on and so forth. On every metric, things are better than ever. I think Steven Pinker understands this almost as much as anyone. I say almost as much because those of us who've read and fully consumed The Beginning of Infinity will be able to spot times throughout the work rationality where there seems to be a sense that things are in fact getting worse and have been getting worse for a while. But I think that this comes down to a kind of political bias in a sense, that because certain political leaders have recently come to prominence that other people think are beyond the pale, then this is an indication that the entire democratic system, for example, is going to hell and that things are getting worse. And I think that's just an error. I think that's an irrationality. But it comes through at certain points within the book, and we'll see that. So also, just before I get to chapter one, what would I say rationality is and how does it accord with what Steven Pinker says it is in this book? I suppose what I would say is that rationality is a commitment to correcting errors, to identifying and then correcting errors, something like that. I think that's the way that the beginning of infinity kind of frames what rationality is. And there are many ways in which we might try to identify and then go about correcting our errors. And if we are consistently trying to do this, then we're consistently aiming for a rational worldview. And the difference with reason is reason is all of those techniques which allow us to do that error correction. Sometimes they can be used synonymously, you know, if you say to someone, well, that would be the rational thing to do. You might also say that would be the reasonable thing to do. And I think that these words, you know, we can't have a perfectly precise language. These words are more or less interchangeable, but it's about error correction, okay? We, we should expect that all of our ideas contain some errors somewhere or other. And the process of trying to identify them is a rational process. The process of correcting them is a rational process. But this might be a just a subtle difference in emphasis when it comes to what Steven Pinker has to say about what rationality is. So with all of that preamble, let's get into chapter one. It's titled, again, in the form of a question, it's titled, How Rational an Animal? And in this chapter, 
Pinker rightly says that we owe our progress, and he lists some of these in terms of moral and scientific process, he, we, we owe this progress to our being rational to human beings being rational. Now, of course, I would say we could clock it up to that. That's totally fine. Or we could clock it up to our being creative, especially our capacity for creating explanatory knowledge. Okay, And so that's what makes us different to every other entity in the entire universe, whether that entity is creating knowledge or not. If it does create knowledge, explanatory knowledge, then it's a person by virtue of that fact. And so that is what enables the progress to occur. And that that very capacity, that very capacity of being creative, because it's not perfect and because it's error prone might be, well, it is, it's also going to be the process that will lead to error because you are guessing what the nature of reality is. You're making your best reasonable or rational guess and you're trying to correct errors that's not a perfect process. And so sometimes it will go wrong. And when it does go wrong, well, someone might diagnose that error as being a kind of a rationality, irrationality. But not always. Just a simple mistake might not be irrational. It might have been your best guess at the time. Now, I can certainly imagine deliberately using falsehoods in a perfectly rational way. Newtonian gravity is one such, okay? We know, technically speaking, strictly speaking, it is, at root, false, demonstrably false, experimentally refuted. However, it would be perfectly rational, and it is perfectly rational, to use it in order to fire rockets into space. And there might be reasons why the more correct version, general relativity, might be irrational to use. For example, if you're a kid and you're building a rocket and you, you just want to try and predict how high the rocket's going to go, using Newtonian gravity could be a wonderful way in which to get interested in the physics of rocketry. But if someone was to say, well, technically, Newtonian physics isn't true, you should be using Einstein's gravity, then it might take you months to learn the formulas and the mathematics and the formalism in order to make the same prediction using the more accurate theory of physics, the more true theory of physics. So there would be reasons why you might rationally discard what is true and embrace what is false in order to pragmatically achieve what you want to achieve and make progress in the world individually or more broadly than that. Okay, that aside, in this chapter one, people get credit for making progress. And it is insinuated, said, that people are special, aside from other animals. He does say, and I find this a little bit obtuse, that some native hunters, the San people, I believe in Africa, quote, owe their survival to the scientific mindset. They reason their way from fragmentary data to remote conclusions with an intuitive grasp of logic, critical thinking, statistical reasoning, causal inference, and game theory, end quote. So this is uh, people who are still living a tribal lifestyle who are hunting in the African plains in order to live. So they are pre-agrarian. They don't have farming and so on. Now, this is impulse and this this happens uh, across documentaries and it, it's just a a feature of our culture it's a feature of western culture that we praise pre-technology or or, or pre-scientific pre-enlightenment cultures as having precisely the same level of development as what we do it's just that they are doing different things now absolutely they have precisely the same anatomical brains as what we do absolutely they have minds that are capable of understanding anything that we do absolutely but they don't have the same ideas that we do there are strict differences between cultures some people use their capacity for understanding the world their universal capacity for explaining phenomena in the world for things other than doing that for things other than relentlessly correcting their errors and therefore making progress in the world. So over the last, well, in this case, apparently 100,000 years, this same extant society has been roughly the same for the last 100,000 years. They still exist. We would say, in our terminology, this is a static type of society. It hasn't changed much. It's not dynamic. 
There's no one in that society that is building rockets to go into space. There's no one in that society that's building ever better batteries for solar-powered cars. So there's building ever faster processes for smartphones and that kind of thing. That's what we're doing. So we are cha- we are undergoing rapid change. And that's the thing that distinguishes us from all all other societies, namely that we are able to sustain, to maintain rapid progress. Our society remains stable under rapid change, which is a very unusual thing. And this is hence why David has this term of a dynamic society. It should be unstable. It should be the case, seemingly, that if you have these sudden changes in society, technological, moral, you have this progress going on, that it should cause great instability and the society completely falls apart. And indeed, in the past, we can see examples of that having happened, but in ours, that hasn't happened yet because we have this culture of criticism. Now, what's that got to do with what is being said here? Well, Pinker is saying of this tribe, an ancient tribe that still exists, an ancient tribe that still relies upon primitive hunting techniques rather than being technologically advanced like us, I would say that the reason they still exist is thus far they have the culture, okay, not the individual people, the culture has been kind of lucky in the sense that there hasn't been sudden changes in the environment. There's been gradual and slow changes. But if they were to encounter a sudden change, a disease, for example, for which they had no natural immunity, unless the West came along with some kind of vaccine or with some kind of other treatment, then they would have to rely upon their existing cultural knowledge because their means by which they create knowledge happens only very gradually. I say all of that because when Pincus says that they are using all of these things, it is kind of trying to praise the ancient tribe in terms that we are familiar with. But is it true to say they are really using a scientific mindset? What's a scientific mindset? Isn't a scientific mindset something that corrects errors in all areas? Isn't it about using experiments to distinguish between the best explanations so far guessed? Can they really explain the world around them? They do have minds that are very similar to ours, okay? And you could take any person from that society, put them into Western society, society, and with some difficulty, okay, the cultural difficulties will be difficult to overcome, but they would be able to learn everything that we can learn. Of course they would. Their mind is universal, just as our mind is universal. The thing is, it's not so interesting what is similar about a person in the West who is using a smartphone and driving a Tesla and dreaming one day of going into space, And the person still living on the tribe who's never seen a smartphone before, wouldn't know what a Tesla is, and still has a prehistoric view of what the nature of the cosmos is. Yes, there are absolutely similarities there. The more interesting thing is, why are there differences in the culture? What's going on there at the level of rationality and reason? How do we explain the differences in the ideas and what has led to those ideas persisting or changing or not over time? That's the curious thing here. And of course, what I would say is this culture of criticism and the primacy placed upon trying to generate explanatory knowledge rather than relying upon rules of thumb, which resemble some kind of explanatory knowledge. Like Pinker lists game theory and statistical reasoning. But for me, that just reeks here of the fallacy of the noble savage. The idea that the hunter-gatherer societies can be explained more or less by precisely the same kinds of knowledge as a modern Western civilization, that seems strange to me. There must be an underlying explanation in terms of ideas or is it, I guess, some combination perhaps of imperialism and theft? Is that, that, that would be a common way of explaining why tribes remain in the state that they are. The only reason that they don't have access to free and universal healthcare, for example, is because of some kind of imperialist uh, attacks from the West on them that are keeping them in that state. Or the relativist argument that they're condition is just as good as ours. Their society is just as good as ours in all respects, and no one should ever feel sorry for a child born in that society as compared to born in our society. They are 
just as able to thrive and flourish in that society as we are. And of course, I think this is completely false. That if truly given the choice, a person who is living in a pre-industrial society on the plains of Africa, hunting wildebeest in order to survive, would jump at the opportunity of living somewhere in the United States, wealthy and safe and healthy. Now, Pinker goes on in chapter one to say, and quote, he says, quote, the cognitive wherewithal to understand the world and bend it to our advantage is not a trophy of Western civilization. It is the patrimony of our species, end quote. And yes, to some extent, yes, the cognitive wherewithal is certainly there. It's there in every human, no matter where they are, from what part of the earth. This is what makes things like racism so ridiculous, irrational, and abhorrent, because every single individual person has exactly the same, as he says there, cognitive wherewithal to understand the world. The question then becomes, why do some people really truly want to understand the world? Why are those people found in the West? And why, if you are born into one of these more pre-industrial societies that still exist, whether in the forests of Brazil or the plains of Africa or the deserts of Australia, why do these people not strive to really understand, for example, the laws of physics, to aspire to have the next best iPhone that's released, to get an ever faster, more powerful Tesla, and so on and so forth. What's the difference? Well, it's not the cognitive wherewithal, is it? It can't be that because we've admitted that it's the same. It's the same universal mind operating in all of these brains, no matter what the particular race, if you like. I don't uh, subscribe to this notion of race. I think it's ridiculous. We are the human race. No matter what the background or ethnicity is, the cognitive wherewithal is the same, the mind is the same. So then what makes the difference? What makes the difference is the knowledge and the ideas, and in particular, the knowledge about knowledge. Hence the importance of the theory of knowledge. Okay, So if you have this stance of wanting to criticize the ideas that are out there for the purpose of improving, therefore, if you have a tradition of criticism in your society, the society overall will improve. And what we say is the difference is the existence of a tradition of criticism in one society, the West, and the rank rejection of criticism of ideas in these more pre-industrial societies. The pre-industrial societies, for everything that Pinker said there, let's just go back, the list of things that he says that they use, they have an intuitive grasp of logic, critical thinking, hmm. statistical reasoning, causal inference, and game theory. So apparently they're using all of these things. And he uses the example of hunting. He's saying that when they're hunting something, they're using all of these things. I don't know that they really do use critical thinking in the way that we might think about it or the way that I've tried to explain it here in this podcast series. It was just my most recent podcast where I talked about the existence of the chief and the medicine man there as authorities are people who in the tribe would tell everyone else what to do. Often the medicine man would tell the chief and the chief would then order everyone else to follow this particular piece of wisdom, false though it might be, sometimes useful, sometimes not. But the point is, rarely were people able to defy the chief and the medicine man. There'd be very severe and violent punishments in these tribal societies for going against the authorities. You couldn't simply criticize in an open-ended way every single idea. So the extent to which there is this true culture of criticism is open to debate. Maybe there were sections about which uh, tribal society can think, maybe hunting wildebeest. You're allowed to think critically about hunting the wildebeest, but you better not think critically about how this society is organized, for example, or whether and to what extent you can leave the tribe and go somewhere else, that for example, or how it is that the children are raised in that particular society, and so on and so forth. So it's not like this universal application of those things that Pinker lists would actually happen in these tribes. So when Pinker talks about the that these things are not a trophy of Western civilization, the mind is not. The mind has been gifted to us by evolutionary processes. That's where the mind comes from, would be my guess. Maybe there's also something to be said for the way in which children are raised early on and certain memes need to be um, incorporated into the infant's mind so that they can think 
broadly about these issues. I'm not so sure. I think maybe just every baby is born with the capacity of having a universal mind. I think that just happens. Whatever. If we're talking about trophies of civilization when it comes to rationality, absolutely. Absolutely, it is a trophy of Western civilization that we have a tradition of criticism. That is a bright line between dynamic societies, societies that have this open-ended exploration of the space of ideas to whittle down what is false from what is more true, and societies that remain static that do not have this and that tend eventually to go extinct. So whether these San people that is used as an example here by Pinker, whether they will persist off into the future has everything to do with the extent to which they will embrace a tradition of criticism. And when they do, they'll be part of the West. <laughs> and they won't be hunter-gatherers anymore because they will choose not to be. Because the rational thing <laughs> would be to choose to do those things which enable you to be um, happier, healthier, wealthier, wiser. People want progress. People want to solve their problems, including people who live in pre-industrial societies. And it is incumbent on us. We're, we're wrong to not offer them that. Shouldn't, certainly we shouldn't force it on them. But the, the, this, this tendency to be utterly hands-off and to not even show them that there is a better way, I think is immoral. So as I say, brains of people around the world are more or less anatomically identical. We're all of the same species, we're all of the same race, so we have the same kind of brains. So it has to be that the ideas that people have is the difference in the culture that causes the difference between these different societies. And that difference is the thing that's worth lingering on in any book about rationality. But what I'm finding is that Pinker emphasizes how they are scientifically minded, they're critical thinkers who use Bayesian reasoning and they're good conservationists as well. They, 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 they embrace reciprocity and the collective well-being of the tribe. They keep all that in mind. It's as if, reading this first bit in chapter one, their existence, the, the tribal existence, sounds almost utopian in how ideal it is painted. I'm almost left wondering, after reading about these San tribe people from Africa still remaining as hunter-gatherers, I'm left at the end wondering why, given their wonderful capacity in thinking all these ways, why, why they don't have the flying cars yet. And, and, and it's buttressed, this discussion of the, the virtues of the San people are buttressed uh, very quickly up against our people in our society who are subject to gambling and the, the irrationality of, of gambling and, and of embracing fake news, for example. So I guess what Pinker is saying from an evolutionary point of view, as is his style, is that if indeed our brains and minds have evolved for survival and ancient tribes manage that so well that, for example, in this particular example he's using, that tribe has remained in existence for 100,000 years, 100,000 years of continuous success in the same place they've had. Why is it that that same mind that allows for the continual survival of that particular tribe also leads in the modern world to all of our bad ideas that we have, like fake news and the tendency to buy lottery tickets? Well, what I would say in response to that is I think there's no great mystery here. There is no great mystery. There's, there's irrationalities in the tribe and there's rationalities in Western civilization and vice versa. Rationality is an application of creativity and creativity is going to produce error as much. In fact, no, not as much. It's going to produce error more often then it generates the correction of an error. Correction of errors is quite hard. Generating errors is quite easy, and it's going to happen in both places at high rates. In some societies, there is less ability to correct errors simply because of the way that children are raised to think outside the box beyond what is permitted to think about. For example, simply leaving the society might be a taboo. So long as the climate does not change too much and too fast, a static society can remain in existence for a long time. It can persist, but it always remains vulnerable to the inevitable change that will indeed come. Our society, only our society, has so far proved so resilient in the face of rapid change 
because we have this error correcting mechanism that operates at all levels of our society from the individual through to institutions and their leaders. The San people have been resilient, but only under very slow change in the climate and the world around it. If there was a terrible flood, as I say, or a disease or a war tomorrow, they could in all likelihood be wiped out by something that would not wipe us out. Now, chapter one um, also sees Pinker discuss some simple math and logic problems. I'll, 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 I'll mention one of those, but I won't steal his thunder by going through all of them. You should get the book for that. They're very interesting. He says that people make mistakes with these sorts of simple maths and logic problems for various reasons. He quotes Kahneman and the thinking fast and slow idea. There is this idea that there's system one that's for rapid thinking, and that seduces us into the wrong answer for many of these simple questions when what we really want is to engage system two, which is the slow and deliberate way of thinking about and understanding the problem behind such questions. I often personally find all these sorts of examples a bit strange. I've written before about certain logic or maths problems that people make a big deal about. For example, this one, the Singapore maths problem. Sometimes these things can be subtle and difficult to understand. It's a skill like mathematics and physics, like music. These things, these techniques of solving these problems have to be learned. Some people are interested in spending lots of time they have fun doing these things. You know, I used to be like this, but others don't. Whether or not being able to think well about some abstract logic puzzle, whether or not that translates into thinking well about your own life decisions or decisions that should be made politically in broader society, I would say is at best an open question. But more than likely, uh, you can see wonderful examples of people who are brilliantly mathematically and logically minded in the abstract sense, who struggle to understand some simple concepts. And in fact, in fact, Pinker himself is going to um, discuss Paul Erdős, who's this uh, prolific mathematician, and he's got this wonderful anecdote in in the book about this. And I, I, I can't wait to get to that one because it's something I learned new about Paul Erdős. I didn't know about this. We'll come back to that. But take, for example, um, um, Ted Kaczynski, uh, a famous mathematician, not so much famous for his mathematics, although no one can doubt his mathematical proficiency, but he was the Unabomber, right? So this is a guy who could understand logic and mathematics and reason abstractly quite well, but ended up being a terribly violent, antisocial, hostile person who didn't understand the first thing about morality, it would seem. And so much can be said about, well, the people who crashed planes into the Twin Towers, as Sam Harris has made this point so eloquently many times. These people, some of them were PhDs and engineers and that kind of thing. Having the ability to think rationally in the way that is sometimes explained rationally, even having the capacity to solve these logic problems is no bulwark against having bad ideas. It's the bad ideas that you can embrace that you think you've embraced rationally. In fact, you might have embraced rationally. You know, again, Sam Harris makes this point that if you are a religious fundamentalist, then you only have to accept for whatever weird reason. To you, it might be rational. But if you genuinely think that paradise awaits, if only you blow yourself up in a suicide bombing, and that not only is this good for you because you'll go to paradise, but you'll be helping these infidels also learn the lesson that this is the set of ideas they need to embrace in order to secure an eternity of paradise and holiness and sacredness and all that kind of thing. So, that, that is rationality, Rash, rationality in perfect service to evil, rationality of that kind. Now, I would say, of course, well, these people aren't trying to correct errors and these people don't have an error-correcting mindset. What they're doing is closing off. They are closing off any possibility of error correction. Once you kill someone, you've completely closed off the capacity to correct errors. And, and in some of these people, of course, they're dogmatists. They don't think it's possible to correct an error, which is why I say rationality is better thought of, better thought of as this desire to identify and correct errors. And as soon as you, um, uh, David Deutsch's moral injunction, right? As soon as you say, um, I don't, there is no error to correct here, or you're not permitted to correct an error here. The, the anti-rational idea of destroying the means of error correction, that's truly what is anti-rational. 
or irrational even, but certainly anti-rational. It prevents you from being able to think about ways in order to make progress by correcting errors. Okay, so here in this chapter one, there is one example um, I'll just mention uh, of the the way in which people can sometimes uh, not think logically, but as I say, I'm not sure it really makes the point that um, that, that people are irrational, for example. Okay, the, the problem is this. Um, Imagine you've got a patch of weeds on a field somewhere and you are told this patch of weeds doubles its size every single day. And it's not until the 30th day that the entire field is covered by weeds. Okay, so we've got that. I want you to think about it for a moment. We've got this patch of weeds. It's doubling in size every single day. And on the 30th day, the field is completely covered. The question then is... How long does it take for half of the field to be covered by weeds? Now, I'll give you a moment. So it's being doubled. So the patch of weeds is doubling every day for 30 days, at which point it covers the entire field. How long did it take for half of the field to be covered? Well, the answer is 29 days, right? So 29 days is how long it takes. Now, sometimes this can seem surprising to people, but of course, if you think to yourself, well, on the 30th day, it's completely full. So um, if it doubled every day, how much of the field was um, covered the day before the 30th day, namely the 29th day? Well, half of it, because on the 29th day, it will double and then the entire field will be covered. So, But some people think, you know, I don't know, I suppose some people will think 15 days or something like that. Now, why would this appear in a book on rationality? Well, I think I think that, and there's a series of these questions. Again, get the book for um, more examples of these questions that Pinker is drawing from elsewhere um, to illustrate a particular point. But what is that point? Well, I think it's the point that if people don't have a ready understanding of a question like that, then the diagnosis is, well, they won't have a good understanding of things more broadly like exponential growth when it comes to an issue like, and he will come back to this, COVID. So people will be irrational about COVID. Why? Because they don't understand exponential growth. Why? Because they can't do a simple problem like how long it takes for the weeds to cover half of a field. Well, maybe, maybe. But like I say, like I say, um, people like Ted Kaczynski can be perfectly proficient mathematicians and simultaneously be completely irrational. So these two things sometimes don't marry up. It's, It's what else you know. I think it's what else you know that really helps with this kind of thing. Okay, so that aside, my favorite example, and so this is the only other one I'll draw from, but he spends a long time on this. And I've spent some time on this before on previous podcasts as well. A certain kind of failure of logic, which I think is more illustrative of people's capacity to think in a certain kind of logical way, or is it? Because um, as... Pinker himself is going to get to, there's a better way of expressing this same problem in ways that people typically are able to get the correct answer. So it's got to do with the degree to which something is abstract versus concrete, as we might say in educational circles. So I'm actually going to read from the book as I um, do with certain other books. Um, So I'll I'll begin. It's called the, the, this test is a famous one. It's called the Wasson Selection Test. And it's titled in uh, Pinker's book, A Simple Logic Problem. Quote, If anything lies at the core of rationality, it must surely be logic, he says. The prototype of a rational inference is the syllogism, if P, then Q. P, therefore Q. Consider a simple example. Suppose the coinage of a country has a portrait of one of its eminent sovereigns on one side and a specimen of its magnificent fauna on the other. Now, consider a simple if-then rule. If a coin has a king on one side, then it has a bird on the other. Here are four coins displaying a king, a queen, a moose and a duck. Which of the coins do you have to turn over to determine whether the rule has been violated? If you're like most people, you said the king or the king and the duck. The correct answer is the king and the moose. Why? Everyone agrees you have to turn over the king because if you fail to find a bird on the reverse, it would violate the rule in so many words. Most people know there's no point in turning over the queen because the rule says, if king then bird. It says nothing about coins of the queen. Many say you should turn over the duck, but when you think about it, that coin is irrelevant. The rule is, if king then bird, not if bird then king. 
If the duck shared the coin with the queen, nothing would be amiss. But now consider the moose. If you turned that coin over and found a king on the obverse, the rule, if king then bird, would have been transgressed. The answer then is the king and the moose. On average, only 10% of people make those picks. The Wasson selection task, named after its creator, the cognitive psychologist Peter Wasson, has been administered with various if P then Q rules for 65 years. The original version used cards with a letter on one side and a number on the other, and a rule like, if there is a D on one side, there is a three on the other. Time and again, people turn over the P or the P and the Q and fail to turn over the not Q. It's not that they're incapable of understanding the right answer. As with the cognitive reflection test, as soon as it is explained to them, they slap themselves on the forehead and accept it. But their unreflective intuition, left to its own devices, fails to do the logic. What does this tell us about human rationality? A common explanation is that it reveals our confirmation bias, the bad habit of seeking evidence that ratifies a belief and being incurious about the evidence that might falsify it. People think that dreams are omens because they recall the time when they dreamt a relative had a mishap, and she did, but they forget about all the times when a relative was fine after they dreamt she had a mishap. Or they think immigrants commit a lot of crime because they read it in the news about an immigrant who robbed a store, but don't think about the larger number of stores robbed by native-born citizens. Confirmation bias is a common diagnosis for human folly and a target for enhancing rationality. Francis Bacon, 1561 to 1626, often credited with developing the scientific method, wrote of a man who was taken to church and shown a painting of sailors who had escaped the shipwreck thanks to their holy vows. Aye, he remarked, but where are they painted that were drowned after their vows? He observed, such is the way of all superstitions, whether in astrology, dreams, omens, divine judgments, or the like, wherein men, having a delight in such vanities, mark the events where they are fulfilled, but where they fail, although this happened much oftener, neglect and pass them by. End quote from Bacon. Echoing a famous argument by the philosopher Karl Popper, most scientists today insist that the dividing line between science and pseudoscience is whether advocates of a hypothesis deliberately search for evidence that could falsify it and accept the hypothesis only if it survives. End quote. Um, this is also the only mention of Popper in Pinker's book, In Rationality. Now, I'm going to, now I'll agree with Popper what Pinker says here, and I won't read the part, but basically the, the, the idea here is with the Wasson selection test, including the one about coins and the more classic example involving P's and Q's and stuff, the, the issue is that it's abstract, that it, if you bring it into someone's real life thinking about stuff, then they tend to do better. You know, it's well known that, 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 that people are more interested in being able to solve problems involving numbers than doing algebra, typically speaking. And when those numbers actually have a dollar sign associated with them, then it's easier still because it means something to them. They care about it. If people don't care about the question you're asking them, they lose interest. They get bored and they switch off and they don't do it. It's got nothing to do with their capacity, I would suggest, to think more broadly about stuff. This is why IQ tests are so dubious. So many of the questions so often are abstract. I took courses at university called logic, philosophical logic mathematical logic. So at the end, you would think anyone who went through this would be able to think logically. Not necessarily. I mean, they can manipulate the symbols and, and go through proofs. That's what they can do. And a proof is a kind of computation. It's a mechanical process that you go through, starting with your axioms, using the rules of inference, getting to the conclusion. But simply doing that doesn't mean that you can necessarily apply those things, necessarily apply those things in a good way to real life problems. And conversely, if you're really good at the real-life problem, that doesn't mean that you can apply it in an abstract way. And Pinker actually explains this as he goes on to say, quote, Suppose the post office sells 50-cent stamps for third-class mail, but requires $10 stamps for express mail. That is, properly addressed mail must follow the rule. If a letter is labelled express mail, it must have a $10 stamp. Suppose the label and the stamp don't fit on the same side of the envelope, so a postal worker has to turn the envelopes over to check to see if the sender has followed the rule. 
Here are four envelopes. Imagine that you are a postal worker. Which ones do you have to turn over? The correct answer is once again P and not Q, namely the express envelope and the one with the 50 cent stamp. Though the problem is logically equivalent to the four coin problem or the PQ problem, this time almost everyone gets it right. The content of a logical problem matters. When an if-then rule implements a contract involving permissions and duties, if you enjoy a benefit, you must pay a cost, then a violation of the rule, take the benefit, don't pay the cost, is equivalent to cheating, and people intuitively know what it takes to catch a cheater. Pause there, my reflection. Yes, that's one explanation, okay, and that's a very concrete way of thinking about it. Or... Just people are interested in this. You, you, your your um, eye is captured by this. Your mind is captured by this more readily for the reasons of identifying a cheater, perhaps. Or just the fact that you're familiar with these things. You're familiar manipulating things like envelopes and stamps and coins and money. We've been trained since mother's knee on this, but not using P's and Q's necessarily. Thinking in an abstract ways. You have to be specifically interested in those things and then spend time learning about those things, finding those things fun to some extent in order to be able to do them reliably over and again. Okay, so that's the Wasson selection test. And I think it illustrates, I think that what Pinker does really well here is illustrate the context matters. The examples really do matter, which kind of makes these uh, academic ways of explaining what critical thinking is um, it sort of suggests that, again, you can be really, really proficient at so-called logic and yet still be illogical in various ways. Or be really logical in a practical sense, using envelopes, let's say, but being unable to do that in an abstract way reliably as well. And, and it's not – you wouldn't label either person perfectly rational, perfectly logical, okay? These are just labels that – apply in a particular context. Okay, so then he talks more about some logic, more about logic again. I'll skip that because that'll come into chapter three and so we can spend more time on that. But then he gets to the very classic Monty Hall problem, something I've mentioned more than once. But here we've got some really interesting historic context. So let me go to that because I wasn't aware of um, this particular part of it. And I think one of the reasons is well, um, I'm just not familiar with the Monty Hall show. I think I first heard about this problem reading a book somewhere or other. It might have been you know, sort of 20 years ago or something. I read a book that described the Monty Hall problem, but I, 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 I wasn't culturally familiar with the Monty Hall problem as I think people in America are. Um, so let's, let, let, let's go through it the way Pinker does it, okay? Um, so this is from the book, quote, one of the most famous television game shows from the heyday of the genre from the 1950s to the 1980s was Let's Make a Deal. Its host, Monty Hall, achieved a second kind of fame when a dilemma in probability theory, loosely based on the show, was named after him. A contestant is faced with three doors. Behind one of them is a sleek new car. Behind the other two are goats. The contestant picks a door, say door one. To build suspense, Monty opens one of the other two doors, say door three, revealing a goat. To build the suspense still further, he gives the contestant an opportunity to either stick with their original choice or to switch to the unopened door. You were the contestant. What should you do? Almost everyone stays. They figure that since the car was placed behind one of the three doors at random and door three has been eliminated, there is now a 50-50 chance each that the car will be behind door one or door two. Though there's no harm in switching, they think there's no benefit either. So they stick with their first choice out of inertia, pride or anticipation that their regret after an unlucky switch would be more intense than their delight after a lucky one. The Monty Hall Dilemma became famous in 1990 when it was presented in the Ask Marilyn column in Parade, a magazine inserted in the Sunday edition of hundreds of American newspapers. The columnist was Marilyn Voss Savant, known at the time as the world's smartest woman because of her entry in the Guinness Book of World Records for the highest score on an intelligence test. Voss Savant wrote that you should switch. The odds of the car being behind door two are two in three compared with one in three for door one. 
the column drew 10,000 letters, a thousand of them from PhDs, mainly in mathematics and statistics, most of whom said she was wrong, pausing there my reflection. So this is the part I didn't know about the Monty Hall problem. It's astonishing, some of this stuff that I read. And we're going to get a mention about Paul Erdish here as well. My understanding of the Monty Hall problem, the, the thing that really... It just makes it clear for me is the, and I think Pinker men mentions this as well, many other people have mentioned it, Sam Harris and various others, this idea that well, all you need to do is to consider not three doors, consider a thousand doors. You know, if you consider a thousand doors and you pick one of them and then he closes all other doors except for one, what are you going to do? Are you going to change or not? Clearly, you've been given information. You know, you're going to stick this one door, which has at the moment a one in a thousand chance of being the correct door behind which the car is. And then Monty says, well, I'm going to close um, 998 other doors, okay? And I'm going to leave one. Do you still really think that the chance that the car is behind your door is one in two? Is that really the way to think about it? Or is it one in a thousand? And now the other one is 999 out of a thousand that it's going to be, in fact, the door behind which the car is. It seems pretty obvious you're being given information. So whether it's a thousand doors or three doors, you should swap. That is the mathematically rational, logical thing to do, right? So I, I knew that, but I didn't know this part. Here's, here are some examples, says Pinker, of the kind of responses that... Uh, the person in question, the, what was her name? Um, someone, Savant, um, Marilyn Voss Savant. Um, so although she explained what the correct answer is, <laughs> she had mathematics PhDs writing to her. <laughs> here's, one, here's one of the responses. Quote, you blew it and you blew it big. Is this Donald Trump? You blew it and you blew it big. Since you seem to have difficulty grasping the basic principle at work here, I'll explain. After the host reveals a goat, you now have a one in two chance of being correct. Whether you change your selection or not, the odds are the same. There is enough mathematical illiteracy in this country and we don't need the world's highest IQ propagating more. Shame! Exclamation mark. End quote. That was Scott Smith, PhD, University of Florida. I like that one. <laughs> Personally, I like that one because it sounds like some YouTube comments I've had over the last couple of years. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the next one. Pinker has quoted. <laughs> quote, I am sure you will receive many letters on this topic from high school and college students. Perhaps you should keep a few addresses for help with future columns. <laughs> w. Robert Smith, PhD, Georgia State University. Maybe women look at maths problems differently than men. <laughs> Don Edwards, Sun River, Oregon. But now, now is the best, best bit that Pinker gets into. Quote, Pinker writes, Among the objectors was Paul Erdish, 1913 to 1996, the renowned mathematician who was so prolific that many academics boast of their Erdish number, the length of the shortest chain of co-authorships linking them to the great theoretician. End quote. So that's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. You know, that even this guy, that is really held up. He's famous among mathematicians. He's famous among anyone who's ever taken an interest in mathem mathematics. If Paul Erdish is writing in to say that the correct answer is actually wrong and doesn't understand why, that's phenomenal. And, well, let's go on because Pinker explains what eventually convinced Erdish he was wrong. Pinker writes, But the mansplaining mathematicians were wrong and the world's smartest woman was right. You should switch. It's not that hard to see why. There are three possibilities for where the car could have been placed. Okay, I'm not going to go through, this is me talking, um, what the answers are because I've already explained that and anyone who wants to can simply look it up. You should switch. The chance of being right, as Marilyn Voss Savant said, is two in three if you switch, only one in three if you stay. Um, Pinker goes on to say, certainly... Quote, certainly there were failures of critical thinking coming from sexism, ad hominem biases, and professional jealousy. Voss Savant is an attractive and stylish woman with no initials after her name who wrote for a recipe and gossip-filled rag and bantered on late-night talk shows. She defied the stereotype of a mathematician, and her celebrity and bragging rights from Guinness, the Guinness Book of Records, made her a big fat target for a takedown. But part of the problem is the problem itself. Like the teasers in the cognitive reflection and Watson selection tests, something about the Monty Hall dilemma is designed to bring out the stupid in our system one. But in this case, system two is not much brighter. People can't swallow the correct explanation, even when it's pointed out to them. This included Erdish, 
who, violating the soul of a mathematician, was convinced only when he saw the game repeatedly simulated. Many persist, even when they see it simulated, and even when they repeatedly play for money. What's the mismatch between our intuitions and the laws of chance? A clue comes from the overconfident justifications that the know-it-alls offered for their blunders, sometimes thoughtlessly carried over from other probability puzzles. Many people insist that each of the unknown alternatives, in this case the unopened doors, must have an equal probability. That is true of symmetrical gambling toys like the faces of a coin or sides of a die and it is reasonable start and and it is a reasonable starting point when you know absolutely nothing about the alternatives but it is not a law of nature okay pausing there um yes so that's all quite right fantastic well explained and and again get the book because pinker goes into um even more analysis of this particular problem um with 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 the examples um, in the book, he does go into a lot of detail with many of these things. Um, you know, my preference would be, well, you could, you could probably have, have done it in, in half the amount of words. But, you know, it, as an introduction to, let's say, rationality, yes, this level of detail is, is good. So that, that there, that analysis of the Monty Hall problem by Steven Pinker, I think is absolutely fantastic. That's, that's worth the price of the book alone because it does as much work as any other example in the entire book to illustrate the difference between rationality and irrationality, I think, and to really put a pin in this idea that if you're a highly trained academic and you're mathematically proficient, that somehow you can think more clearly by virtue of the fact that you have understanding in this specialised area, that this understanding of mathematics, of the ways of thinking logically, and Paul Erdish is second to none in being able to think this way, that does not make you immune from making errors, even errors within your own area of expertise. And so people can be irrational. They can be completely irrational, even about the areas where they're supposed to be experts. That's worth keeping in mind. That's worth me keeping in mind. It's worth everyone keeping in mind. No matter what your speciality is, you can make terrible blunders. And we shouldn't be accusatory of people or having a go at people on the other side of the political aisle or who have different ideas to us because they're making a particular mistake. Because you are just as fallible as they are. Everyone is fallible. And what the Monty Hall problem, it, the history of the problem shows, and what um, we're talking about there, what Pink is talking about there is, you know, having having this level of overconfidence when it comes to something so simple, and that you can make errors in something so simple, even if you're operating up here at this really high level, and you think you understand these rarefied areas of mathematics, that when it comes to the, sim- the, the basics, the absolute basics of something like probability theory, you can make terrible mistakes. But that doesn't stop you making progress at the really high level either. Okay, so there, there's, there's, lot, there's lots of ways you could think about and analyze what's going on here. And I guess reflexively, in the spirit of that, um, you know, you know, what I'm saying here about the work of Stephen Pinker, I think it's very good. But at the same time, I think like Paul Erdish, although it's his area of speciality, I think sometimes in this very book, he makes fundamental um, egregious <laughs> errors to some extent. Let's go to one of those. Let's go to just one of those. Uh, page 22 and 23, where he's talking about, again, logic and probability. And people might be able to guess what I'm going to say about this when I get there. So what Pinker does in this particular part is to talk about the conjunction fallacy, the so-called conjunction fallacy. So I'm going to skip ahead to where he describes it accurately, and he uses something from Zversky and Kahneman, and it's called the, the Linda problem is what they have, the Linda problem. And the Linda problem works well, but... Earlier in the book, Pinker changes the Linda problem to something else and, in my opinion, ruins it. (laughs) Ruins it for important reasons. Let's see the way that Zvarsky and Kahneman originally put the Linda problem. Here we go. This is from their work. Quote, Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Please indicate the probability of each of these statements. 
Linda is a teacher in elementary school. Linda is active in the feminist movement. Linda is a psychiatric social worker. Linda is a bank teller. Linda is an insurance salesperson. Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Respondents judged that it was likelier that Linda was a feminist bank teller than that she was a bank teller. Once again, the probability of A and B was judged to be higher than the probability of A alone. The dated vignette with its baby boomer Linda, backhanded compliment, bright, passe protests and declining occupation, betrays its early 1980s vintage. But as any psychology instructor knows, the effect is easily replicable. And today, highly intelligent Amanda, who marches for Black Lives Matter, is still deemed to be likelier to be a feminist registered nurse than a registered nurse. Okay, so pausing there, my reflection. Yes, so this is uh, this idea, the conjunction fallacy, that if you put these two things together, they seem to be more probable than one of the things on their own, which mathematically is, of course, impossible. Now, the problem I have with the way Pinker does this, that reading it again, actually, that doesn't really work for reasons I'll come to. Um, I think the conjunction fallacy is fine and whatever else, but framing it in terms of prob probability is problematic. Let's explain why. Here we go. This is what Pinker says earlier on in the book. He subtitles this, a simple forecasting problem. Quote, once we get into the habit of assigning numbers to unknown events, we can quantify our intuitions about the future. Forecasting events is a big business. It informs policy, investment, risk management, and ordinary curiosity about what lies in store for the world. Consider each of the following events and write down your estimate of the likelihood that it will take place in the coming decade. Many of them are pretty unlikely, so let's make finer distinctions at the lower end of the scale and pick one of the following probabilities for each. Less than 0 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.5%, 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, 25%, and 50% or more. So here are the claims that Pinker wants you to assign a probability to. 1. Saudi Arabia develops a nuclear weapon. 2. Nicolas Maduro resigns as president of Venezuela. 3. Russia has a female president. 4. The world suffers a new and even more lethal pandemic than COVID-19. 5. Vladimir Putin is constitutionally prevented from running for another term as president of Russia and his wife takes his place on the ballot, allowing him to run the country from the sidelines. 6. Massive strikes and riots force Nicolas Maduro to resign as president of Venezuela. Seven, a respiratory virus jumps from bats to humans in China and starts a new and even more lethal pandemic than COVID-19. Eight, after Iran develops a nuclear weapon and tests it in an underground explosion, Saudi Arabia develops its own nuclear weapon in response. End quote. End the list of things there that Pinker puts there. Now, if you are familiar with the work of David Deutsch, and you have an understanding of probability theory, then what can we say about this? Absolutely none of them in the list are matters of probability. They are all either going to happen or not going to happen. The probability in each case, if that's what you want to call it, is that thing will happen in our timeline or that thing will not happen in our timeline. If it happens, it happens with probability one. If it doesn't happen and you die, then throughout your life, the probability of it having occurred is zero. It never would have happened. There's no um, change in the way in which your life would have been lived or was lived, which would change the fact that it either happened or didn't happen. Things happen or don't happen. They don't happen with a probability of 0.5% or 50% or anything like that. Number one on the list is Saudi Arabia develops a nuclear weapon. What's the probability of it happening? Is there a right answer to this? If you put down the probability of it happening is 50%, what does that mean? What does it really mean? Because it's either going to happen or not in the next 100 years or 1,000 years or whatever. And if it happens, it happens with probability of 100%. Whether it happens is completely determined by the knowledge that people in Saudi Arabia who are making the decisions about to build a nuclear weapon actually construct that knowledge or not. If they construct the relevant nuclear physics knowledge and they construct the centrifuges and they manage to get hold of the uranium or plutonium or whatever, then they can develop a nuclear weapon, but not otherwise, so far as we know. This is what is required in order to develop a nuclear weapon. And none of those things are matters of probability, but matters of choice and constructing explanatory knowledge in order to do so. It's not a matter of probability. 
Now, of course, this is being a little unfair to what Pinker is doing, because what Pinker is doing is trying to illustrate a different kind of error, the error of this conjunction fallacy, that people tend to say things like, for example, number two on the list, Nicolas Maduro resigns as a as president of Venezuela, sometimes they will assign that with a particular probability. They might say, oh, there's a 20% chance of that happening. But then you go further down the list, and it's number six says, massive strikes and riots forced Nicolas Maduro to resign as president of Venezuela. Well, people assign that a higher probability. They might say 40%, because they've been told, well, massive strikes and riots, well, they, they, they kind of think, well, that thing will cause Maduro to resign. But of course, the reason for Maduro resigning is going to reduce the, the probability according to this particular way of analysing things. So you should always assign a lower probability for that conjunction of things than you should for the thing that is just standing on its own, namely his resignation as president for whatever reason has to be higher, There's a, the, 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 the reasons for it occurring, and it will occur, it will occur for some reason, it's going to occur, he's going to resign, well, either he's going to die in office or he's going to resign or be voted out or something, right? he's going to leave office for some reason, but if you were going to assign a probability for that, I would say 100%, eventually he's not going to be president ever, <laughs> he's not going to be president for whatever reason, given a particular reason, you know, the, um, the, the massive strikes and riots has to bring that probability down when you put those things together. That's what Pink is saying here. So I'm being unfair to him because, you know, that's all he's trying to say here. But there are other ways of talking about this conjunction fallacy, which don't require you to talk about things that aren't matters of probability. And especially in a course at a university where you're doing critical thinking or rationality, I would hope that um, students will be comfortable putting up their hands saying, but none of these are matters of probability. <laughs> no, they're not. You know, they're, they're either going to happen or not going to happen. We don't live in a world where things happen probabilistically. And that includes, by the way, the flipping of coins. Subjectively, yeah, subjectively, you don't know. You know that it's going to land heads or tails. But when you do flip it and it lands, well, it's landed with heads and that you live in a universe where the probability of it beforehand was in fact, in fact, 100% that it was going to be heads because the laws of physics uh, determined that's what was going to happen. But subjectively, you just didn't have the relevant information. Anyway, it's too far afield from what we're doing in this book, of course. But just to turn the mirror of rationality back onto Professor Pinker for a moment. <laughs> okay, and as we move towards the end of the chapter... Chapter one, I've sort of, I haven't read much. I've talked more about it than I read. Um, we get to cognitive illusions. And I would say to you, buy the book for that. It's really interesting things to say about how these illusions, in my words anyway, some of these illusions, I'll put a picture on the page, um, really are about the extent to which our prior knowledge affects what we perceive, what we see. Or in other words, as Popper would say, observations are theory laden. So I'll skip most of that. But just to say that if we're writing a book on rationality, why you would skip critical rationalism, the preeminent way in which people should be, the normative claim, they should be thinking rationally. I don't know why you'd skip Popper because Popper explains that sort of thing, these, these kind of illusions that appear in the book here. Namely, this one here, and there's so many like this. You know, the the, the you know the, the dress example is one, but here's another one where um, the 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 dark area here and the light area here, in fact, aren't dark and light. They are exactly the same color. It's an optical illusion. And what Popper would say is, well, observations are theory laden. Our 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 very senses themselves are expecting a certain thing, and so our brain causes us to see something which is illusory. And the way that Pinker frames this is, of course, well, in real life, in real life, when you see something like that, a box like that, indeed, you do see the front of it as being darker than the back of it and so forth, because there's such a thing as shadows. Okay, so I'm skipping through to chapter two, chapter two, and chapter two is titled Rationality and Irrationality. He begins with a complaint that rationality is supposedly uncool. And I guess this depends on what circles you mix in. I know when I was at 
school myself, as a student myself, yes, the words geek and nerd were pejorative. But I know for a fact now, certainly in some schools, maybe the better ones <laughs> that I've been familiar with anyway, they're now badges of honour. Uh, there are subcultures of kids who are nerds and geeks and so on who are exalted as being the popular and the cool kids. That's just the way it is. So the kids exist in subcultures. Some kids want to be geeks now. They aspire to be, you know, the next generation of Elon Musk's and Bill Gates and why not? I mean, that's where the money is if that's the way in which you want to be successful. So I think that's changed over the last few decades. He does go on to make some remarks that, of course, I'll agree with about the poverty of postmodernism. All of that's quite well. But then we get to this. Um, so I'm skipping the, the first part of the chapter. Uh, and he writes, okay, he's, he's got a subsection titled Reasons for Reason. And he asks the question, what is rationality? As with most words in common usage, no definition can stipulate its meaning exactly. And the dictionary just leads us in a circle. Most define rational as having reason. But reason itself comes from the Latin ration, often described as reason. A definition that is more or less faithful to the way the word is used is the ability to use knowledge to attain goals. Knowledge, in turn, is standardly defined as justified, true belief. End quote. So he takes this um, uncontroversially. Okay, so this is just assumed true throughout the book. And because it is, then we can have a book about rationality and the rational ways in which we can try and justify as true our beliefs. And if you're not adequately justifying things, then this is irrational. And indeed, he goes on to say, quote, straight after that, after saying that knowledge is justified true belief. This is the standard definition. He writes, quote, We would not credit someone with being rational if they acted on beliefs that they were known to be false, such as looking for their keys in a place they knew the keys could not be, or if those beliefs could not be justified, if they came, say, from a drug-induced vision or a hallucinated voice, rather than observation of the world or inference from some other belief, end quote. Yes, the example's correct, but the explanation for the example is not. The explanation for the example is not. As I said earlier, there are all sorts of ways in which you can act. Now, I won't use the word belief, but you can act on knowledge you know to be false. You don't, indeed, you don't have to believe it at all. Newton's theory of gravity. Newton's theory of gravity, Newtonian mechanics. You can know it to be false. And therefore, you should not believe it because you know it's false. But it can be perfectly rational to act upon it. For example, in building a bridge, in launching a rocket, you can use this. Not because it is strictly speaking true, let alone justified true, or that you believe it, but because it solves a particular problem. That's what it's about. If you are seeking to solve your problems and in doing that, correcting errors, to the extent the errors need to be corrected, that's rational. And of course, it's not a matter of beliefs. Whatever beliefs are, I, I struggle to really understand what this concept of belief seems to be. On the one hand, you look up a dictionary and it's defined as being something like those things you regard as being true. So known to be true or whatever. In other moods, people tend to use the word to mean something lesser than the word no. But as I have emphasized here, you should be using the word no for things that you think could be false. I know Newton's law of gravity. I also know that it's false. Okay? Knowing something doesn't mean that you think that it's actually true. It might simply mean, well, it's the best explanation that I have, but not always. It could just mean that you know it, even though you know that it's false. But believe, if I say I believe something, I, I believe the sky is blue, then on the one hand, it might mean you really, really think that the sky is blue. Like I believe in God. When people say I believe in God, they think I really, really think that God exists. In fact, it's often the one thing that they refuse to give up on. It's the thing that they endorse as being true more than anything else. But other times when you say believe, it can have a completely different meaning. Well, not a completely different meaning, but if I say 
I believe my mother's in the next room. Oh, where's mum? I believe she's in the next room. That indicates a lack of certainty rather than certainty. This, for me, this means that belief shouldn't be a part of epistemology. Epistemology is about knowledge. And we can more carefully constrain what we understand the word knowledge to mean, following Popper, following Deutsch, without ever being concerned about what this term belief is, about what anyone thinks on the matter, any particular person. It's about the extent to which the errors have been corrected. And knowledge, of course, unlike beliefs, is something that can be instantiated in objects. That, that a book doesn't believe anything, but it absolutely contains knowledge. It contains knowledge that can be transmitted from one place to another. But then he goes on to talk about more about beliefs. And I think uh, this is what I suppose can also make the book valuable for anyone, as I uh, flagged early on. If you felt like you missed out on a course at Harvard University on epistemology or critical thinking or rationality, or from any one of the other you know, top universities, whether in the Ivory, the Ivy League universities in the United States or, you know, Oxford or Cambridge, if you think you missed out on philosophy, if you think you missed out on the absolute best teaching that's out there, then this book contains some of that. I think it's useful to know what is being taught and what um, the content of epistemology is in these institutions and is commonly thought to be critical thinking and so on. So it's an, excellent, it's an excellent summary. The book is an excellent summary of critical thinking, rationality, as understood in academic circles. As, as we notice here, and this is such a perfect example, and David Deutsch has observed this before, when you read these kind of books, it's as if Popper had never existed. It's as if he just, uh, he's, he's not the key philosopher involved in epistemology. We see it there. This is a wonderful example of where Popper gets invoked. How? Falsification, of course. You know, he, he was the guy that figured out that what science is about is falsifying ideas rather than verifying as true ideas, confirming as true ideas. And this is the extent to which your university academic and professor, broadly speaking, even if they're engaged in philosophy of science, even if they're engaged ostensibly in epistemology, this is what they think Popper contributed to. You don't need to write multiple books of that length there, as Popper did, and essays and lectures and so on and so forth, to just make that point. That's not what his corpus of contribution to philosophy and science and epistemology is. It is far broader and deeper than that. And it really matters. It really matters on this point about knowledge being justified true belief. Why? Because if we need to have justified truths in order to claim something is actually known, then we readily slide into dogmatism or relativism. And Pinker will know this better than anyone, I suppose, or as well as anyone. That if you can't justify as true something, and people quickly realize they can't really justify something as true, as absolutely true, and so because of this, what happens? When they fail to do so, and they will fail to do so, in the university context, what do they do? They fall into relativism. They fall into postmodernism. They go, well, it's all pointless. You can't, in science, justify that theory as true. After all, science is always overturning its theories. Therefore, nothing is absolutely true. Therefore, everything stands on all fours with everything else. Let's just be relativists, because nothing can ultimately be shown to be true. This mistake only comes about because people think that to know something means to justify it as true. Serious problem. Affects the universities. It's an entire philosophy that comes from, I would argue, that central mistake of thinking that knowledge is about trying to justify as true something. And it's not. <laughs> now, on the other hand, on the flip side, if you're not in the university, if you're not in the rarefied areas of university and coming to this realisation yourself... Then what you do is you go down the other equally false route of thinking, well, the only way to justify things as true is to be dogmatic. If it's written in the holy book or somewhere else, if, if the scientist says it, then it's justified as true. You become a dogmatist. Then you, you rely on authoritarianism, the authority of the person who is in possession of that ultimate truth, the dogmatists. 
will say to you, it's justified as true because it's written in this book or it's been peer-reviewed or this priest has said and so on and so forth. This expert has said, then I'm justified in thinking this is true. Therefore, I can say I know it. Both of these things are equally false. It's wrong to say that there is no truth because you can't justify things as true. It's wrong to say that everything else is false other than what the people who are the experts and authorities say is actually justified as being true. That's what we know. No, Popper dismisses both of these and says, it's not about justifying things as true. It's not about justifying beliefs as true. Forget all of that. Knowledge is conjectural. You guess it, you error correct, you look for the problems in what you hitherto know, correct the errors, identify better solutions, and therefore make progress. And along the way, you say, I know this thing, either as my best explanation of reality, or I know this thing to be false, or I know this thing to be false but useful. This is what knowledge is. Knowledge is useful information. Knowledge is that information which tends to get itself copied. Knowledge is that stuff which, once instantiated in some sort of physical substrate, tends to cause itself to remain so. Knowledge is resilient information. All of these are similar ways of circling the same idea, but at no point do we need to say they are justified as true, nor does anyone have to believe them. That's wonderful. That's unique. That's different. And why it doesn't inform books on rationality, courses on critical thinking? I don't know. Because it's a much better razor in terms of being able to slice through the BS that exists on either the side of the dogmatists or the relativists. You only get this problem of dogmatism and relativism if you go down the platonic road, okay, Plato's idea, that you need to be able to justify as true your beliefs. That's an error. And it causes so many other problems. So this is not, this is why I'm focusing on it and why I'm ranting about it right now. This is not a minor academic problem. It is very serious. It affects academia, but it affects broad, normal day-to-day -day life, discourse in the world out there. We've got religious fundamentalists on the one hand causing problems for everyone, and postmodernists on the other are causing problems for everyone as well. Popper is needed. It, it, because... These ideas affect people's behaviours. So I think that, you know, opportunities are missed to explain Popper to a, a broader audience. We know that Steven Pinker has read and respects David Deutsch, so he could have gone back to the beginning of Infinity that uh, he, he, he read, he says, uh, for Enlightenment Now. He could have just referenced something from that book about knowledge. But all of that said, okay, so I've, 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 <laughs> I've um, uh, criticised uh, Steven Pinker great Stephen Pinker. I think he's great. He does excellent work. You know, again, he's an ally. But <laughs> this is why I think that, yeah, should he write more books on this topic? And hopefully he does. He, he goes back and reads what Popper has to say and promotes Popper a little more. But he does get, he gets objective truth right. Let, let me skip to um, page 40 now. So let me go ahead. And he writes this, quote, now arguments for truth, objectivity, and reason may stick in the craw because they seem dangerously arrogant. Who the hell are you to claim to have absolute truth? But that's not what the case for rationality is about. The psychologist David Myers has said that the essence of a monotheistic belief is, one, there is a God, and two, it's not me, and it's also not you. The secular equivalent is, there is objective truth, and two, I don't know it, and neither do you. The same epistemic humility applies to rationality that leads to truth. Perfect rationality and objective truth are aspirations that no mortal can ever claim to have attained. But the conviction that they are out there licenses us to develop rules we can all abide by that allow us to approach the truth collectively in ways that are impossible for any of us individually. Pausing there, my reflection. Yes, but an opportunity has been missed here. So uh, the final ultimate absolute truth is unobtainable, but it's out there. But this can also cause people to fall into relativism if you say that, if you express it in, in that way. What you immediately need to follow it up with is, nonetheless, objective knowledge. Objective knowledge is absolutely possible. It's not the final word. It's not justified as true. It's knowledge. It's useful information. It's knowledge that solves, information that solves a problem. That's what objective knowledge is. It either objectively solves the problem or it doesn't. That's a true or false claim, and that is easily noticed in the world. So 
it can get confusing if on the one hand, the uh, instructor at the front of the critical thinking or rational rationalist course, rationalism course, says to the cohort of students, hey, guess what? There's this thing called knowledge. It's justified true belief. How do we justify as true our beliefs? Hmm. Well, we can't, in the next breath, we can't actually get to the absolute justified objective truth. So hmm, it must mean that knowledge isn't quite um, possible either. But hey, we can follow methods of rationality that lead to the truth. <laughs> All of this gets confusing, and I understand why an undergraduate or even a graduate coming out of such a course might be confused and fall into a dangerous form of lazy relativism. What we need is to be able to tell people, guess what? Despite this inability to get to the final truth, correct, Stephen Pinker, we can't get to the final truth. There is such a thing as objective knowledge, knowledge that could be wrong. It has the possibility of being wrong, of being shown wrong. But until such time as it actually is shown wrong, and it has proved thus far to solve our problems, we regard it as actual knowledge. It's objective knowledge. Objective because it could be shown false. And when it is, sometimes it still maintains its usefulness as knowledge. Newton's theory. Okay, the rest of uh, the chapter, there's more material rightly criticizing relativism and postmodernism. Uh, with a slant, he's kind of got a slant here in the book and in this chapter about our present circumstance, where people are obsessed with various phobias and isms to do with race and class and gender and sexuality. Yes, absolutely. So um, it, it, it's, it, it to me, it, it, very much, as I say, it's like notes for a lecture at a university. Okay, this is what the university uh, and the, I guess the media in various places are um, kind of focused on right now. These this race, class, gender, sexuality stuff, um, and so um, the the examples there uh, circle that. And so it's useful for certainly an undergraduate going through university, or again someone who would like to be familiar with what might be talked about in lectures at a modern university these days. Now he does spend um, lots of the chapter defending reason against unreason, I suppose. Um, I, I, sometimes I'm left wondering who he's debating, like who are these people out there that are arguing against reason? Um, you know, even people that we disagree with, even, as I say, the religious fundamentalist terrorists, they would think they're, beha they're behaving rationally and reasonably. They've just taken on the wrong idea, right? If, if the idea is, if you blow yourself up in a suicide bombing, you're going to go to paradise, and this is the most holy and good thing that you can do with your life, it's rational to do it. Okay, we might think it's evil and wrong and whatever, and we need to go deeper and to criticize his original ideas, namely thinking that particular ancient books contain the final truth. Okay, that's a problem. But once you accept that false premise, other things fall out logically. Many people have made this point before. I think in, in um, this kind of book, it's enough to say that reason works, unreason doesn't. Reason leads to solving your problems, to um, making progress. Unreason does quite the opposite. Okay, It leads to static societies and you can't correct your errors because you're not aiming at correcting your errors. So he gets to a point in the book, in chapter two, where he asks the question, quote, must we always follow reason? Do I need a rational argument for why I should fall in love, cherish my children, enjoy the pleasures of life? Isn't it sometimes okay to go crazy, to be silly, to stop making sense? If rationality is so great, why do we associate it with a dour joylessness? Was the philosophy professor in Tom Stoppard's play Jumpers right in his response to the claim that the church is a monument to irrationality? And then he quotes the play, quote, The National Gallery is a monument to irrationality. Every concert hall is a monument to irrationality. And so is a nicely kept garden, or a lover's favour, or a home for stray dogs. If rationality were the criterion for things being allowed to exist, the world would be one gigantic field of soya beans. End quote from the play. The rest of this chapter takes up the professor's challenge. We will see that while beauty and love and kindness are not literally irrational, they're not exactly irrational either. 
we can apply reason to our emotions and to our morals, and there is even a higher order rationality that tells us when it can be rational to be irrational. Pausing there, my reflection. Uh, as I say, if you embrace the idea that rationality is more about correcting errors and making progress, you don't fall into this debate so much. Is love rational? Is keeping a garden, let's make it even easier, is keeping a garden rational? Absolutely. Why? Well, if it's fun, it's rational. Why? Because as we like to say around here, reason is fun. There's absolutely nothing wrong with enjoying life. That should be the purpose. And how do you enjoy life? By continually solving your problems, correcting errors, making personal progress in whatever way you think you should. The meaning of life is solving your problems. And if you fail to continue to solve your problems, you will become unhappy. And ultimately, you will die if you can't solve that problem at the end. There, And I think uh, Professor Pinker does make this point in, in the book uh, around about this time, that, well, it's wrong to think that there is this opposition between reason and emotion. That makes no sense. Lots of people have made that error over time. I remember um, Sam Harris would talk about this as well, that you know, um, people would accuse him of being overly rational for whatever reason and that, you know, you might not be able to prove that God exists, but that's being too rational. After all, can you prove that you love your children? Well, it's a ridiculous question, okay? In neither case is it about proof, I would say, in the first place. But what we're really looking for is explanations and rational explanations or non-rational explanations. And it's perfectly rational to have a good explanation of why you would love your children or you would want a garden and so on and so forth. All these things that people enjoy, it doesn't make them irrational. It doesn't make it irrational just because you enjoy something. You, you could jump out of an aeroplane, okay? You could be one of these people who likes going skydiving. That does not make it irrational. It can be fun. Fun is rationality. Having fun is rational. Having fun is perfectly rational. What's the alternative? Not to have fun? That would be irrational, wouldn't it? Just to avoid fun all the time? Again, this is why reason is fun, right? Doing stuff that involves reason is actually fun and part of perhaps the central part of life. For more on that, see, of course, the work of Luli Tannett, among others, and David's The Fun Criterion. Now, chapter two also invokes um, the wonderful teaching the horse to talk um, uh, uh, example, which is in the beginning of infinity as well. And we also get in this chapter, uh, being a, a cognitive scientist, a psychologist, of course, this idea of the, the marshmallows. Can you wait for the marshmallow in the hope that you'll get two in the future? Or do you want to eat the marshmallow now? And psychologists make a lot of this because children, when um, offered a single marshmallow, but told, don't eat the marshmallow now, Wait 10 minutes and I'll give you two. Some of them eat it and some of them don't. It's impulse. But all of these kind of examples, just like as Pinker says elsewhere in these first two chapters, that it's, in a sense, more rational to save money now for your future than spend it now in many, many cases. But then later on, he does double back on that and he goes, well, it kind of depends on, well, he doesn't use these words, but it depends on what your problem, problem situation is at any time. Okay, if you... Um, of course, have sickness, ill health, something like that, then you might very well need to spend all of your money now, your savings now, rather than save for the future. You might need to cure an illness that you have right now. There's many situations like this in which using up the resources now rather than saving for the future is the more rational thing to do. Neither of these things that you can't make a black and white claim about what to do with money, resources, marshmallows right now if you're really hungry as a kid in that experiment, then having the marshmallow right now makes more sense than the kid who's just eaten breakfast. They might be able to wait more easily for 10 minutes because, and the kid who has you know, low blood sugar diabetes might really, might really be very rational for them to have the marshmallow immediately rather than wait 10 minutes for two marshmallows when they've fallen unconscious. Okay. Um, I, I don't think I'll read the rest of this chapter. It's good, okay, there's, but there's lots of stuff there about tax and carbon and pollution 
which makes me think, and again, it sort of stands in contrast to some other things that Steven Pinker writes um, about how good the present is. He's kind of suggesting that the present isn't that good because uh, when it comes to pollution, this is a standard example, the past was extremely polluted. All the ways in which the water supply was polluted uh, or in which we, couldn't, which we couldn't deal with bushfires or forest fires, and so the air used to get more polluted. Now, of course, in the Industrial Revolution, the air was even worse, but by any metric today, in many, many places, the air is far cleaner than what it was a few decades ago. I know in the United States is certainly like this. Like, yeah, of course, China is coming up and burning lots and lots of coal and they're putting lots of rubbish into the atmosphere. Yes, but it's a transitional phase. They'll get through this and uh, then their air will be as clean as the United States and Australia and so on and so forth. Once you, once you get to the point where you have nice clean coal or other clean forms of energy, nuclear and so on, then your, your air will become clear. And of course, and of course, car technology, a ma- major contributor to making air look grimy and dirty and having these little particles, well, uh, things can get better. Things can get so much better if you just improve the technology with transportation, means of transportation. But I might just end it on, uh, Pinker talks about how we can't get an ought from an is and, you know, this, this David Hume fork. Now, he makes a big deal about this. He thinks that it's false. It's true, you can't get an ought from an ears. Um, but as David Deutsch points out, and this is the key point many people miss, it's a key point that many people miss in the philosophy and epistemology of David Deutsch, his great insight is explanations are not derived in the first place. They're guessed. That's what you get this from Popper. Which means not only can't you get an ought from an is, you can't get an is from an is either. Okay, that's just not the way that explanations work. That's not the way that science works. The, the mistake is, you know, you, you don't just look at photons of light falling down to the earth and go, oh, those photons mean that it is the case that general relativity is true or that you know, light is made of photons or that light is a wave or any, anything else of interest in science. Just because you see something is the case does not mean you can get the explanation of what is the case. The explanation has to be creatively conjectured and then measured against the experimental observations that you make. This is an encounter between what we imagine to be the case and what we measure and observe to be the case as well. So whenever you hear people make a big deal about you can't get an ought from an is, true, you can't get an ought from an is, but you can't get ises from ises either. You don't derive morality from what is the case in the natural world but you don't derive what's true in science, philosophy, or anything else from what is the case in the natural world either. So that's where we end it today. But in summary, for these first two chapters, an excellent overview of rationality, as I imagine it is still taught in the university context, with lots of contemporary examples drawn from news stories and the culture of today, and extremely well written as well. Um, So uh, very useful for people who are new to this idea of critical thinking. Um, But if you've read Popper and Deutsch, uh, you might find, as I did, that um, on every other page, there was something that you kind of raised your eyebrows at and thought um, there might have been a better way to have expressed this. So this could have been better informed, certainly by the epistemology known as critical rationalism, which I think is the greatest bulwark against irrationality. Until next time. Bye-bye.